let's go ahead and get started again here on our Critical Care Symposium. It is a pleasure to introduce another friend, good colleague, Dr. Mark Sutherland. Dr. Sutherland completed our EM, I am Critical Care residency program here, and we were thankful enough to keep him on staff where he splits time between the medical ICU, our emergency department, and quite honestly, I don't, the list of what Mark does in addition to those shifts and clinical requirements and responsibilities is quite lengthy. Expertise in IT, he's also overseeing a new area within the medical, University of Maryland Medical System, really overseeing our access center and doing a tremendous amount in just a short time completing his residency. It's really a pleasure to have him for a few moments here in our critical care symposium to talk about some alternative modes of mechanical ventilation. During the break, we were able to troubleshoot the poll everywhere. So please refer back to your email this morning about how to log in to poll everywhere. We very much want to make this interactive and are looking forward to seeing your responses throughout the rest of the symposium. So Dr. Sutherland. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Winters. And um, thank you, Dr. Winters, Dr. Brown, Doreen, everyone for organizing this wonderful conference and uh, the opportunity to speak today. It's, it's an absolute honor. Um, so I'm going to hop right into it. The, I feel like the gauntlet has been thrown down. Uh, Dr. Allison mentioned in his talk a preference for volume control always, and I have trouble disagreeing with him, but he, uh, he challenged me to convince you otherwise, so I will see what I can do. I will say we're going to talk about a few more advanced modes of ventilation today, and I've chosen to focus on PRVC, APRV, and SIMV specifically because those are modes that I think are very useful in the emergency department, have a role in emergency medicine. Um, but to Dr. Allison's point, volume control is a very reasonable mode of ventilation, and I think a nice uh, default place to start. Um, but at the very least, you will see patients on these modes, uh, whether you get sign out on a patient who has been placed on one of these modes, or your respiratory therapist places the patient on one of these modes, you will absolutely manage in most EDs patients on PRVC, APRV, or SIMV. And so I think having familiarity with them is, is worthwhile. Uh, so I have no financial disclosures. I'll kind of move past that. Um, so there was an excellent podcast on MRAP uh, maybe five, six years ago. It was actually one of our now alumni, Haney Malamet and Mel Herbert. And they were mostly talking about non-invasive mechanical ventilation, talking about BiPAP and high flow and things like that. But Haney uh, really espoused the very interesting observation that for whatever reason in mechanical ventilation, a lot of things come down to what we call the rule of twos. So things tend to show up in pairs. And I just wanted to kind of further emphasize the point that when you talk about invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, the default modes we tend to use are actually pairs of pairs. So for whatever reason in pulmonary physiology and critical care, you see a lot of things that show up as pairs of pairs and are kind of two by two tables. So our, our default kind of basic modes of ventilation would really include pressure control, pressure support, uh, volume control, and volume support. But we're going to try and move a little bit past that in this talk today and talk about some fancier modes. So I'm going to cover uh, three main modes, like I said, PRVC, which is pressure regulated volume control, APRV, which is airway pressure release ventilation, and SIMV, which is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. And um, in the US, there are about 250 or so ventilator modes that are approved by the FDA. So there's a lot out there. The good news is, if you look at it, most of them are actually issues of kind of brand names. A lot of the vent companies will make their own kind of name for a special mode. So if you break it down, there's actually about 40 to 50 really unique vent modes. And most of them are really variations on a theme. So they're actually all, for the most part, have certain pieces in common, and they change certain parts. So I would argue, actually, at least at our shop, I can't speak for too many other places, but at University of Maryland, if you're familiar with those four basic modes from the original table, PRVC, APRV, and SIMV, probably 99% of the time when you walk into the room of an intubated patient anywhere in our hospital, you will be familiar with the mode they're on. The only exception to that, I would say, is I considered talking about a mode called PPS or PAV, um, which is used a little bit more in shock trauma, um, and it's a little bit more of a weaning mode, and I don't think that useful in the ED, so I opted not to talk about it. Plus, it's still pretty much a niche mode, so you really won't see patients on it all that often. And so we're going to test out our poll everywhere. Oh, great, we've already got some responses. So my question is, how do you use PRVC, APRV, and SIMV, kind of generally speaking, across all three modes in your practice on a scale from 
never heard them to I use um, them regularly. We're seeing responses come in. That's great. Very exciting. Our poll everywhere is working. We're all golf clapping here in the room. So um, it looks like most people have some familiarity but don't really use them. And so I think that's a very reasonable response. And so before I get into the specific modes, um, I want you to all kind of mentally prep yourself. How are you going to think about the things I'm about to tell you? And I think there are two basic philosophies. One is kind of these are rescue or niche modes. These are modes that someone might give me sign out and they're already on it or my respiratory therapist might place them on it. Or maybe there are certain scenarios where I use them. Um, but they're not really my go-to. They're not really my standard of care. And I think in emergency medicine, that's perfectly reasonable. I'm going to talk about some specific clinical scenarios where you may want to consider putting a patient on one of these modes. But um, I think it's very reasonable to kind of view these as rescue modes or niche modes. And I, I, like I said at the top, I have trouble disagreeing with Dr. Allison when he says that volume control should kind of be your go-to. But uh, at least at our shop, we will absolutely see patients on these modes all the time. Um, so first of all, as Dr. Winters alluded to, I'm a little bit of a computer nerd, and I was so happy with the fact that when I made my PowerPoint slides, I just put the titles on for each of the sections, and PowerPoint suggested these fancy little an animations. And actually, it nailed two out of the three. So the, the SIMV one's not great, but the pressure-regulated volume control one, you can see there, is actually perfect for PRVC. And the reason is, um, one, obviously, it's a ventilator, so we're blowing gases like you see on the screen. But two, PRVC is really a kind of a, a combination of two competing concepts. So it's us trying to take two things that really don't go together and trying to get the best of both worlds, and I would argue at times kind of failing. So I think that animation is actually perfect for PRVC. So at the top of each section, I'm going to ask you your comfort level with the mode, and hopefully that will help me kind of dial in how much detail to give you guys and how advanced to be in this. Um, I don't want to go over by everybody's head, but I don't want to um, bore everyone as well. So I'm not sure if it's showing up, but I'm going to ask you your comfort level with PRVC. Excellent. We're seeing some responses. And I tried to have some fun with the rating scale. So on a scale from 1 to 5, your options are, uh, what does PRVC stand for again? I feel like I've heard of this before. I understand the basics. I'm very comfortable with PRVC. And then option 5 is a uh, SAT-style analogy. Me to PRVC is the same as Amal Matu to EKGs. I see no one is bold enough to select option 5. So. That's very reasonable. I wouldn't select option five either. So. Excellent. So it seems like pressure regulated volume control. We have a, oh, it's, wow, it's quite the race one now. Someone took number five. Thank you. It's very bold of you. So, um, and it's anonymous. We don't know who you are. Um, excellent. So let's talk a little about pressure regulated volume control. So uh, PRVC was very popular kind of in the late 2000s, I guess, teens. I don't know what the term for that is, around like 20, 2010 range. Um, and I think it's cooled off, at least at our institution, a little bit. Um, but it used to be, at least when I started my residency, you would see everybody was on PRVC. And it was marketed as this quote-unquote respiratory therapist in a box, was kind of the way it was phrased. So they, the companies would go out and market their variant of PRVC. As a respiratory therapist in a box, you can just set it and forget it. And I think that causes some problems. The way I tend to explain PRVC is to the patient, it's pressure control. So if you're the intubated patient in the MICU or wherever you are in the ED, and you're getting the breaths, it's actually very difficult to tell pressure control apart from PRVC. So the patient's getting pressure control-based breaths. Whereas to the provider, the respiratory therapist, the physician, whoever it is setting the vent, it's volume control. You're putting volume control settings in. And so for any of you sitting there listening to that, you might be thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. Those two are discordant concepts. And actually, that's absolutely true. By definition, you can't control volume and pressure at the same time unless you have control of the patient's compliance, which you don't. And so, therefore, what the machine is doing is it's trying to use guesswork, essentially, to convert my goals as the provider for volume control into pressure control-based breaths for the patient. So what the machine is doing is, for example, I might set a patient on PRVC, and I put them on a tidal volume of 400, and the machine gives a pressure control breath of, let's say, 20 centimeters of water. And then what happens is the machine looks, it actually gives, most of the machines give three breaths, and then they average across the three breaths. But it looks, and it says, OK, on average on those three breaths, we got 320 milliliters for our tidal volume. And it says, OK, that's low, so I need to increase my pressure. And so it, it gives the next three breaths our pressure control of 22 centimeters of water. And it gets 360, and then it says, OK, I still need to go up a little more. And it gives three breaths at 24 centimeters of water, and it gets about 400, and we're good to go. So what the machine is doing, again, is it's trying to kind of convert my objective as the provider based on volume control type settings into pressure control ventilation for the patient. We'll talk about why that's a good thing or a bad thing 
and some of the pearls and pitfalls with this. The other thing, I alluded to it before, unfortunately all these vent companies come up with their own names for all these vent modes, so it's very confusing. So you may see different names for what I'm describing here as PRVC. Um, on the Draegers, it's called Autoflow or VC Autoflow. Um, on the Puritans, it's VC Plus. Um, I think the Newport name is particularly cruel, Volume Targeted Pressure Control, although that's actually probably a better description of what PRVC is, but it's like PRVC kind of reversed. Um, on Viasis and Maquettes, we use Maquette servos here in our ED and our ICU. Um, it's called PRVC, and then it's APV CMV on the Hamiltons. So you may, unfortunately, you just got to kind of know your ventilator and what it's going to be called. So I have a video here, and first of all, before we start playing the video, I'll preface it a little bit. Um, I have two videos I'm going to show you with vent waveforms. Um, the second one I was a little better about kind of pausing it as I went, so you'll see some text on the screen explaining what we're looking at. Um, first of all, credit where credit is due. Um, this is a phenomenal website. It was created by a co-fellow of mine. If any of you know Sammy Safadi, he is brilliant. Um, was in critical care fellowship with him. He's also nephrology boarded and a computer genius. And so he created a, um, a website for mechanical ventilator simulation. And so I'm gonna demonstrate what PRVC looks like on a vent using some of these, um, some videos from his website. Um, you can see the address if you wanna use it down there in the bottom right, iculearning.us is his title page. It used to unfortunately be that you could go to the website and just use it, but um, now you have to email Sammy and get access. But I think he grants access to most anyone. So um, just to orient everyone a little bit before we play the video, the, um, we're gonna see across the top center there, and it actually looks like the video started, so that's perfect. Um, what we're seeing there are the pressure, flow, and volume waveforms. So this is, I've switched the patient to PRVC. In the bottom center, we're seeing the, um, the settings for the vent and then the patient's characteristics. So what the machine is doing right now, you can see there's variation in that pressure waveform up top. I know it's a little small, I apologize. Hopefully you guys can see it bigger on your computer screen, but um, you can see the machine is adjusting those pressure curves to try and find the right tidal volume. Now what I've done is I've actually changed my tidal volume from 500 to 400. And what the machine has done, if you're watching that P peak in the very top right, the machine had a peak pressure of 17 with my tidal volume of 500. And what it's done is dialed down that pressure to try and hit the tidal volume I'm looking for. Now what I do in the video is I increase the patient's compliance. So I'm gonna double the patient's compliance. You'll see we'll get higher tidal volumes than we desire because of course, delta V over delta P is compliance. And so we're gonna get increased tidal volumes. The machine's gonna continue to ratchet down that pressure to try and target the tidal volume I'm trying to hit. So again, what the machine is doing is it's using its information that it's getting back about tidal volume that tells it the patient's compliance to try and hit the tidal volume I want using a pressure breath, okay? So titrating PRVC. So for each of the three modes we're gonna talk about, I have a slide kind of walking you through how to come up with settings and how to titrate those settings. I think this is the most important for the ED doc to know. Your respiratory therapist, the person you get signed up from, whoever may have put the patient on PRVC, on APRV, on SIMB, whatever the case may be, and if you run into a problem with the patient, you need to know what to change. Obviously, one option is just change the mode, of course, but um, you need to know what to manipulate to change the, the to, to improve the patient's clinical situation. So the good news for PRVC is titrating PRVC is identical to titrating volume control. There's no difference at all. Um, from our perspective, again, PRVC is volume control. And I know uh, Dr. Allison walked through um, in great detail how to set vent settings on standard modes like volume control. So I'm actually not gonna review this in detail. If we have any med students or interns watching who haven't done MICU yet, you may want to take a screenshot of this slide. Um, this is, at least for me, the way my brain works and the way I think about basic vent settings in a mode like VC. What we have there is we have, again, two by two tables. Things just tend to come in pairs in, in mechanical ventilation for whatever reason. So I have in green there the PEEP and the FiO2, which primarily control your oxygenation, your tidal volume and respiratory rate in red. They primarily control your CO2 clearance. And then the two low and the two high tables down below in the same positions as those four things up top, they tell you what happens if those settings are too high or too low. And so the, again, I won't belabor the point because Mike, of course, did a great job covering this before, but um, a big one I do want to point out, which he did a great job of talking about, the too high table there, um, oxygen toxicity for your FiO2. So that's something absolutely to consider. And I completely agree with Dr. Allison about the importance of paying attention to FiO2. All right, so before we start this video, this is another video from Sammy's website. This is, um, I wanna talk briefly about something I call the PRVC vicious loop. 
And this is one of the big drawbacks, I think, of pressure regulated volume control. And I think a lot of people aren't aware of this. And it absolutely is something you need to be familiar with because it can cause problems with your patients on PRVC. So the, the clinical scenario is this. At the beginning of the video, I've got the patient on PRVC. And it, I don't know if you can see it. It's probably a little small on your screen. But Sammy's simulator has a box you can check at the bottom for whether the patient's breathing spontaneously or not. And so the video is going to start in a moment with the patient being completely sedated, paralyzed, what have you, not interacting with the ventilator. And what I'm going to do is, over the course of the video, I'm going to wake the patient up and have them interact more and more with the ventilator. And of course, um, for any of you who have been up in an ICU or have the same thing in our EDs, when patients are intubated and when they wake up, they tend to be air, what we call air hungry, right? They tend to want higher respiratory rates and higher minute ventilations than we're giving them. If someone comes in, let's say, as an overdose to your ED, they get intubated in the field or intubated in the ED, and you, you set their settings kind of according to their physiology, and you get that perfect blood gas. They've got just the right PCO2, just the right pH, just the right PO2, and then they wake up. They tend to overbreathe the ventilator more times than not. Not always, but more times than not. And so that can cause problems. PRVC doesn't respond well to air-hungry patients. So we're going to start the video playing, and I'll kind of walk you through what we're seeing here. I've also got some text on the screen, and it will pause when the text shows up on the screen so you guys have a chance to read it. So this is run-of-the-mill PRVC, no problems, patients sedated, paralyzed, whatever. What I'm going to do now is check that checkbox to have the patient start breathing. Okay, in a few seconds the video will start going again. It's just it's an auto-pause, you're good. Um, and the patient will wake up, they'll start breathing. After that, what I'm going to do is increase their respiratory rate, and then I'm going to increase their diaphragm activity. So first of all, you can see the waveform change. If you look at that purple line, the second waveform, that's your flow curve. You can see the, the characteristics of the flow curve changed because the patient is waking up and breathing. If you can see those numbers on the far right, you also may notice the patient's getting alkalotic. They're 745 because they're over-breathing the ventilator. And that's OK. Thus far, we're doing all right. In a second, the video is going to start again. You can ignore the pause. I forgot to take that off uh, icon on the screen there. The video will start itself. And um, I don't know if you can see, what I'm doing now is increasing the respiratory rate to 30. And even this PRVC deals with tachypnea pretty well because, again, remember, PRVC is trying to control the tidal volume. PRVC is not paying attention to the minute ventilation. So it's just looking at the tidal volume. So it responds to tachypnea reasonably well. But let's say our patient's air hungry. They're anxious. They're in pain. They're delirious. Ashley's talk uh, before was very apropos. This is a situation where patients are waking up. Uh, they're at high risk for delirium or agitation. And they're often tachypnic and drawing high tidal volumes. So thus far, we're doing OK. What's going to happen next is you may, if you can see the, the small print, um, there's a value in the bottom center called P mus. And P mus is the force that the patient is generating with their diaphragm and their respiratory muscles. And so what I'm going to do is increase that. It's currently 5, and I think I change it to 10. I'm going to eventually on the video change it to 12 and then 15. And I want you to watch the values on the top kind of right side of your screen there, the values we're getting from the ventilator, the blood gas, the end title. Watch what happens. And in particular, watch that P peak in the very top right. What's going to happen is the patient, and you can see the pressure waveforms are shrinking, right? So that top line is our pressure waveform. And those, they're becoming smaller and smaller because the patient's drawing more tidal volume on their own. And so the machine is saying, well, to maintain the tidal volume I'm supposed to have, I need to give less pressure. So the machine is trying to dial back in the tidal volume that I, as the provider, told it I wanted. But what does that do to an air-hungry patient? It only makes them more unhappy. So the patient's becoming increasingly air-hungry, increasingly agitated. Usually, to Ashley's point about, uh, about RAS, this is the point in time where they're RAS plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4. They're getting agitated and flailing around. And so what's going to happen next, you can see they're getting increasingly alkalotic on those pH numbers on the right. The machine is giving them less and less support as they draw more and more air themselves. And I'm increasing the PMUS if you're watching the video there. And this is just worsening the cycle. So the, the way I describe it is the patient is chasing after the ventilator, and the ventilator is running away from the patient. Every time the patient says to the ventilator, give me more support, the ventilator says, I'll give you less support. And naturally, you can't really sustain a pH of 7.7 .7 very long. This patient's at high risk of what we call biotrauma, which is injury to the lungs and the, other rest and the respiratory muscles due to um, desynchrony with the ventilator. And usually what's going to happen is they're going to tire out. 
So the acid-based disturbance will cause them to pass out or their respiratory muscles will fatigue. Or to be honest with you, the way this usually plays out is we run in the room with propofol because they're swinging their arms and about to self-extubate and we push a bunch of propofol or rocuronium or whatever the case may be. And so to finish off this video, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is decrease the PMUS there from 15 to five and then very shortly thereafter, I'm gonna uncheck the spontaneously breathing box. Now we have a problem. The patient's getting almost no tidal volumes. I think they dip to the double digits. The pH swings from 7.7 .7 to 6. I think 4.7 is as low as it goes. Now, the good news, that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is PRVC is an adaptive mode of ventilation, right? So what it is gonna do, and you're watching it happen right now, the machine has realized it's, un it's well under its tidal volumes because it was relying before on patient effort. What the machine's gonna do is it's slowly increasing its pressure. You're seeing that top curve get bigger and bigger. It's gonna slowly increase its pressure to try and get back to a normal tidal volume, back to my set tidal volume. And the patient's gonna end up at a reasonable pH and a reasonable tidal volume eventually. But in the meantime, they went through a pretty wild swing in pH. Now, the, to be fair, SAMI simulator is probably a little dramatic. I don't know if they go as high as 7.7 and 6.4, but maybe. Um, and so we'll end up in a reasonable place, but the patient kind of got agitated, they maybe got sedated, they tired out, and they had a pretty wild swing in pH and PCO2. And then the real problem with this, of course, is this cycle repeats. So what's gonna happen 30 minutes from now when that propofol we gave them or the rocuronium we gave them wears off? Well, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna wake up again, and this is gonna happen all over again. So that's the PRVC vicious cycle. And I do think it's a problem, like I said before, that people need to be aware of with PRVC. When the, patients want, when the patient wants more air, the machine gives them less support. And actually, I alluded before to PPS and PAV, which I'm not really gonna talk about today. But interestingly enough, the dynamic of PRVC in this situation is exact opposite of PPS and PAV. So there are other modes where, which do the exact reverse. When the patient wants more support, they give more support. In PRVC, the, the, the opposite happens. The more air the patient seems to demand, the less they get. And so this, this causes a pretty significant limitation of PRVC when the patient's awake and interacting with the ventilator. And as I mentioned, it can lead to swings in pH and PCO2, and it leads to a lot of biotrauma, which is not as big a consideration in the ED, but is absolutely something we think about a lot up in the ICU. If the patient is fighting the ventilator, they're gonna injure their respiratory muscles, they're gonna injure their lungs, and if they're not in ARDS already, they're gonna go into ARDS. So a few pros and cons and kind of my bottom line for PRVC. So upsides of PRVC, I didn't talk about this extensively, but generally speaking, pressure modes are a little more comfortable for patients, they're more physiologic. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's true most of the time. PRVC typically allows for tidal volume control to some degree. You're not gonna hit your tidal volumes as accurately as you would with volume control, for instance. It usually allows you to do some degree of tidal volume control. And then it handles dynamic compliance fairly well. So if the patient is gonna have changing lung compliance, that's really what it's designed for. Downsides of PRVC, you can get into these feedback loops of the vicious cycle I just talked about. For that reason, it's not really good for air hungry patients. And then I think it can create this kind of set it and forget it mentality where we set PRVC and we walk away. So my personal practice and what I suggest is I use PRVC for he reasonably heavy sedate, heavily sedated patients who are gonna have changing lung compliance. The classic example is patients were diuresing. We are pulling lung water off to try and improve their lung compliance or patients who are kind of going into ARDS. I think they're decent candidates for PRVC. But my honest answer is, if you never use PRVC, I think that's perfectly fine. I have yet in my experience to have a single patient that I can think of where I've said, I wanna put this person on PRVC, I'm so excited to do that. Um, I don't think that really happens. So if you get in trouble with PRVC, just switch back to volume control. I think that's a reasonable approach. So the next is airway pressure release ventilation or APRV. Like I said, PowerPoint nailed two of these. I love this. This is, the bubbles are just such a great metaphor for the release of APRV. Um, so what is your level of comfort with APRV? Your options are one, I volunteer the person sitting next to me to answer that question. I guess that doesn't work on a virtual format, but go with me. Um, it sounds vaguely familiar. I know the basics. I feel very comfortable with this vent mode. Or I am an APRV maven, on to the next slide. Okay, we're getting a lot of people who know the basics, some folks vaguely familiar. Thankfully, no one's never heard of it since I've been introducing it. All right, oh, a couple of people have never heard of it. All right. Perfect, so it looks pretty similar to PRVC, I'd say, although I think we have more people who are on the, not even at the basics level yet, which is fine. So this is a perfect 
uh, introduction, I'm going to move forward here. Thank you for your responses. So um, APRV, first of all, APRV is one of the more controversial topics at all in critical care and certainly one of the more controversial vent modes. So I kind of um, analogize it to, it's kind of like uh, ethanol levels or urine drug screens in the ED. It's pretty rare to meet an intensivist that doesn't have some strong feelings about APRV. Um, really fundamentally, APRV is a form of pressure control. At the end of the day, it's kind of a very weird version of pressure control. And it's based on something called inverse ratio ventilation or, and the open lung strategy. So right now, we're all sitting here breathing. Hopefully you guys are breathing. If not, put something in the chat and we'll come resuscitate you. But you're sitting here breathing, spending more time in expiration than inspiration by a ratio of about two or three or four to one, depending a little on your breathing. And so that's typical breathing. So when we do pressure control, for example, on the ventilator, we mimic normal breathing and we have the patient spend more time at the lower pressure, the PEEP, then we have them spend at the pressure support, that higher pressure. APRV turns that on its head. It says we're gonna spend more time at the higher pressure than at the lower pressure. And so ignoring the FiO2, which is set on essentially every vent mode, there are four settings for APRV. Again, two by two tables. I don't know why it works out this way, but it does. P high, P low, T high, and T low. So you have your higher pressure, that's P high, your lower pressure, you have the time at the higher pressure, that's T high, and the time at the lower pressure. So your waveform ends up looking something like this. And what you can see is P high in this example is set to 30, P low is set to zero. We'll talk about settings in a second. And then the T high is again that width of the curve you see there, the time that we hold the higher pressure for, and T low is the time we hold the lower pressure for. Again, in APRV almost always T high is much longer than T low. The other thing I think this diagram illustrates well is in true APRV, the patient has the ability to inspire and expire above the P high. So we call it titling over P high. So you can see there, there are those little dips in the green line. What the patient is doing is they're using their own diaphragm, their respiratory muscles to breathe over P high. Okay. So the patient is, again, they're doing that with their own effort. That's not the ventilator doing that on their own, using their own muscles. So I have the following question for you all. A patient is on APRV with the following settings, P high 30, P low zero, T high five seconds, T low zero seconds, not zero point something, zero seconds. What vent mode are they essentially on? Your options are PRVC, volume control, BiPAP, CPAP, or I don't know. I don't know if everyone's being shy or hopefully our poll everywhere is still working. <laughs> I'm sure it'll take a second. Excellent. IPAP, CPAP, CPAP's taking the lead here. I don't know, there's a few, okay. PRVC, excellent. All right, so it looks like the majority is settled in on CPAP. We have a few votes for the others. BiPAP is making a run for it. All right, so for the, I'm gonna pause here for the 57-ish percent of you that said CPAP, you are correct. So. Essentially, if you have a T low of zero, you never have those releases. And I'm sure a lot of people have thrown a CPAP answer now. I've still got the slide open. Um, you have those releases, and if you, you have a non-existent release or a release that lasts zero seconds, right, you are essentially on CPAP. And so I'm gonna talk a little about weaning APRV in a second, and that's really relevant when we talk about weaning APRV. So one more poll everywhere question here on APRV. Um, you have a patient on APRV, they're getting more hypercarbic. This is free text, so you can text in whatever you want. What do you change about the vent settings? I'm gonna to need to be able to read our screen, so apologies for the camera. I'm gonna step a little closer to our monitor. We should start seeing some text show up. Longer, I assume that meant flow. T low, sorry, that's perfect. <laughs> that's not a typo, longer T low. Lower P high question mark, okay. Come on, be confident. Increase T low, okay. So we've got two votes for increased T low. Increase T high, interesting. People are trying to reason through this physiologically. I like it. Increase P high and or T low. Respiratory rate, okay. So whoever said respiratory rate, you're on the right track, but there's no setting for respiratory rate. T low, increase respiratory rate. Okay, so T high, perfect. I'm sure answers will continue flowing in, but in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. Increase pressure, increase rate. So you're all, Really, the responses were very much on the right track, but let's talk about how to operationalize that with the settings you have to work with. So a little bit about setting and titrating APRV. As I mentioned before, you got four things to work with, P high, P low, T high, T low. 
So first of all, two of them are kind of knocked out for you, which is kind of nice. Um, essentially, the P low in traditional APRV is always set to zero. The reality is the, the alveoli in the lungs actually never make it to P low. And so it really doesn't matter all that much what you set P low at, but you want to maximize that release. So the lower your target pressure is for P low, the further down you're going to get, the more expiration you're going to get. And so traditional P low is always set to zero. So there you go, one down, three to go. T low, I'm actually going to talk about a little more on the next slide. T low is typically set to target your flow to be 70 to 75% of your peak expiratory flow at the end of the flow curve. So I'm going to show you, if that doesn't make sense, I'm going to show you a diagram on the next slide, which will help. But T low isn't really titrated based on the patient per se. It's titrated based on your vent waveform. So it's kind of dealt with separately. T high, which is really the answer to the prior question, is titrated to achieve your desired respiratory rate. And this is where APRV gets a little counterintuitive. There is a mental leap for people more familiar with volume control and pressure control for how APRV works here. Your T high plus your T low gives you your respiratory cycle time. So if you have a T high of five seconds and a T low of one second, your respiratory cycle time is six seconds and you're getting 10 releases per minute or 10 machine breaths per minute, right? So the people who said increased respiratory rate were spot on. What you wanna do is try and increase your respiratory rate. We generally don't mess with T low, as I said in the last bullet point there too much on the count of this. So what you're gonna do is decrease your T high if you're getting acidotic and hypercarbic. So what that does is decreasing your T high increases your respiratory cycles per minute, your breaths per minute, and it allows the patient to blow off more CO2. Obviously, if they're getting alkalotic, you're gonna do the reverse, you're gonna increase your T high. And then this is another weird thing about APRV. P high is typically actually set. It depends a little who you ask. Dr. Hubashi, who's a world expert in APRV and trains a lot of us on APRV, um, actually talks about getting a chest x-ray at P high and setting it based on the distension, based on your diaphragm. So if you recall a normo distended chest x-ray, you have the peak of your diaphragm roughly in the midclavicular line. And I'm sure all of you are used to looking at over distended and under distended x-rays. So you actually get a chest x-ray and you decide your P high in large measure based on are, is the lung normo distended. So some examples of typical APRV settings, um, 30 centimeters of water for your P high would be kind of roughly in the range of what we're talking about. Again, your P low is always zero, T high of five seconds and a T low of 0.5 seconds. And then I skipped over it real quick, but we weaned APRV by what we call drop and stretch, where what we're doing is we're decreasing our P high and we're lengthening our T high. And essentially what the patient, which was my question before, what the patient ends up on essentially is CPAP, right? So you can imagine if you had a, a T high of a very large number, like 60 seconds, 120 seconds, we'll occasionally see patients on APRV with these kinds of settings. That patient's essentially on CPAP at that point. They're getting a release ventilation once a minute, once every other minute, but that patient's essentially on CPAP. So what we do is we wean by drop and stretch and the patient ends up at the end of the day kind of on CPAP once they wean off. So this is the explanation I mentioned before in terms of expiratory flow. What you're gonna do, diagram A there is kind of an infinite, if you will, time for exp expiration. You have a peak in expiration, then it trails off. Um, what you're doing is you're titrating your T low so that you end up with diagram C there. So you can actually pause the waveforms on most ventilators and you're gonna say, if, you're, if you look at diagram C, if your peak expiratory flow on that diagram is minus 100 roughly liters per minute, what you wanna do is you use that little scroll wheel and you find the point where it's minus 70, minus 75, something like that. And if that's 0.4 seconds into the expiration, you go ahead and you hit um, 0.4 as your T low or whatever the case may be. All right, so one challenge with APRV, one big challenge I think that makes it kind of unappealing if you're not as familiar with it, is ventilation, blowing off CO2 is much more complex with APRV. Um, as I mentioned before, awake patients may what we call tidal over P high. You do need to be aware that certain ventilators do not allow that. So for all my Maryland people, for instance, we use servo ventilators in our uh, MICU and in our ED. So you'll mostly encounter maquette servos. They have a mode called bivent, which is the servo version of APRV. In bivent, the inspiratory and expiratory valves are locked at P high. And so the patient actually is not able to title over P high. And so if you actually put them on APRV, especially if you started that drop and stretch to wean them to CPAP, you'd have a problem because the patient's not gonna be able to do what you're supposed to do on CPAP, which is breathe in and out over the machine using your own muscles. So you gotta check your own ventilator and make sure you're in the right track. I will say shock trauma here at University of Maryland does a lot of APRV and they use the Draegers for it. Um, and I pers my personal experience is it works nicely on the Draegers, but 
you got to check with your, your personal um, institution's ventilator. Um, in addition, as opposed to volume control, for example, where you have tidal volume and respiratory rate, there's a number of different settings that impact minute ventilation. That's why actually almost everybody who put answers in the free text before was right, because you can change different things to impact your minute ventilation. You can change your P high, you can change your P low, you can change your T high, your T low, the sum of your T high and your T low. So it gets a little complex to figure out your minute ventilation. So my recommendation with APRV is you pay very close attention to your minute ventilation, to your end tidal. You're, you probably should be getting regular blood gases and getting a pH and a pCO2, a VBG is fine. Um, and then the other thing is because patients are having trouble expiring, if they're hypotensive, strongly consider auto peep. I'm, I imagine Dr. Winters may talk about that a little bit in the crashing ventilated patient. So um, getting air out is the main challenge with APRV. And so pros and cons and kind of bottom line with APRV. Personally, I think APRV is good for refractory hypoxia. Um, and especially if that refractory hypoxia is from ARDS. I think there's some physiologic rationale for why it makes sense in refractory ARDS cases to consider APRV. Is there a lot of great data to support that? No, um, but I think there's at least a good physiologic rationale. Downsides of APRV, it's a little harder to titrate, as I mentioned, the variables interact in a bit more complex of a manner. Um, I would not, not, not recommend APRV, typically speaking, in patients who are at risk for auto peep or hypercarbia. The classic example is COPD patients. I think you, you use APRV in those patients at your peril. Um, and then another downside is it's not optimal, of course, to be getting regular chest x-rays to titrate, but that's not usually a huge deal. So my suggestion for APRV, it's, I think it's good for refractory hypoxemia, especially if it's due to ARDS. I would stay away from it if we're talking about COPD or other reasons the patient won't be able to expire well. And so last but not least is SIMV. The good news is SIMV is extraordinarily simple. And so I'll be able to blow through it real quick here. Um, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. How comfortable are you with that? Your options are one, the files are in the computer. I hope everyone gets the Zoolander reference. Um, two, I may have seen a patient or two on SIMV. Three, I feel like I know the basics. Four, I'm pretty comfortable with SIMV. Or five, I practically invented SIMV. Getting a lot of people who are comfortable with it. Some people wanted the Zoolander. Files are in the computer, excellent. Got the basics. Okay, most people are pretty comfortable with APRV, or sorry, SIMV, excuse me. I misspoke a few times there, I think. And actually, that works out pretty well because I'm going to cover it pretty fast. And although a few more of the less comfortable people are weighing in now. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So um, SIMV is actually very simple when you wrap your mind around it. If all it is is a combination of two ventilator modes. And actually, there are all kinds of variants of SIMV out there. Generally speaking, when we just say SIMV, what we mean is what's called SIMV VC plus PS. And so um, when I say SIMV, that's kind of what I'm referring to, although there are other versions of SIMV out there. And it's actually very simple when you think about it. All it does is you set volume control settings, right? So your four things, your PEEP, your respiratory rate, your FiO2, and your tidal volume. And the patient gets ventilated according to volume control uh, at, with those settings. But then you also set a pressure support level. So that might be like 10 centimeters of water, 5 centimeters of water, 15 centimeters of water, whatever it is. And what happens is, in between those volume control breaths, if the patient initiates another breath, the machine delivers a pressure support breath to that patient using the pressure support setting. So they're getting a basic kind of basal, if you will, rate of volume control, and then layered on top of it is pressure support. Um, and all it requires is the components uh, the settings for the various component modes that are involved, and that's what you have to set. So the good news is titrating and setting SIMV is actually very simple. It's the exact same as setting the underlying component modes. The weaning is really the key with SIMV. So SIMV was marketed for a long time and really used for a long time as primarily a weaning mode. Um, and in fact, the primary place you see SIMV used is in PACUs. Um, anesthesiologists still occasionally use it as kind of a weaning from sedation mode. And so the weaning of SIMV mostly happens by reducing the rate, the control rate, on, um, on the backup, the, vent, the volume control. Um, and so SIMV, the nice thing is it allows for varying degree. You can think of it as kind of cross-titrating a patient between a control mode and a support mode. And so I think upsides of SIMV, you can layer on more comfortable modes on top of a backup mode. As I mentioned before, pressure support tends to be a little more comfortable for patients than something like volume control. And really, I think the main upside is it's useful when you have a patient whose mental status is going to be changing, the respiratory drive is going to be changing, 
and you're worried about their ability to clear CO2. So I think there are great, two great examples of that. One I gave you already, which is the, the anesthesiologist in the PACU. You have a healthy 25-year-old with normal lungs who came in for an elective hernia repair or whatever, got intubated, got sedated, is now still groggy, just coming off propofol in your PACU. That's a patient whose mental status you expect to improve substantially over the next you know, hour or so as they wake up. And what you can do is put them on SINV and then you're guaranteeing the volume control type ventilation. But as they wake up, they, get, they essentially end up on pressure support. You just slowly crank down that, that volume control rate. Right? If you're on SINV with a volume control rate of zero, you're essentially on pressure support. The other example, and I'm sure if you all emailed George Willis, he would love to send you his talk from a few years ago. Um, George gave a great talk a few years ago um, talking about DKA, of course. And he was talking about intubating the DKA patient. And he um, went through one way you can use SIMV as essentially delayed sequence intubation to cross titrate a patient over from volume control, or sorry, over from pressure support to volume control. So you're going the opposite direction of the anesthesiologist. You're slowly sedating the patient. And SIMV will help you cross titrate them over from pressure support to volume control. Not many in the way of downsides. You can get high tidal volumes. Probably shouldn't use this in like florid ARDS patients where you're worried about the tidal volumes although we should be worried about tidal volumes in all patients. Um, it adds a little bit more complexity, but it's not too bad. And then it's not always necessary because most of the support modes have this already as a backup. And so take-home points, Amal always says three to five take-home points. This works out well. I have three modes to talk about. So PRVC, I would consider it for relatively sedated patients who have changing compliance. They're being diuresed. They're going into ARDS. You expect their lung compliance to change. APRV, I like to use it as kind of a backup um, you know, rescue mode for refractory hypoxemia, especially if it's due to ARDS. And then SIMV, if you expect the patient's mental status to be changing, and especially if you want to guarantee them that minute ventilation that they get with volume control. And so with that, thank you so much for your time, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Winters. Thanks, Mark. That was simply outstanding. I'm going to turn things actually over to Dr. Chan for any questions before we transition to our next discussion. All right. Thanks, Dr. Lynn. Great talk. Um, the one question that I have here is uh, for APRV, is there a quote unquote safe P high similar to trying mm -hmm. to minimize P plat in uh, volume control? Uh, it's a great question. So um, there is definitely over distension, under distension issues with APRV. Um, as I mentioned before, it's largely titrated to the chest X ray. And so there are various things you can look at on the ventilator and on the imaging to try and make assumptions, if you will, about where you are in the distension curve. I didn't talk about PEEP titration and stress index, but what I would recommend if you're really messing around with APRV on an ARDS patient is that you periodically switch them to square waveform volume control and you do a stress index and a PEEP titration to see what their, their distension curve looks like. Um, in the interim, I think the best answer I can give to your question is there's no safe or unsafe number. I don't, you know, it's not a PEEP lat less than 30 situation. But I would suggest um, getting regular chest x-rays and trying to normalize that distension in the lung. And that's really the best we have for right now, I would say. 